Good morning, everyone. Uh, praise the Lord. Welcome to class. Thank you all for uh, uh, joining class this morning. Uh, we'll begin. Um, can I ask one of you to please lead us in prayer? Anyone can unmute your mics and lead us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for being with us throughout this week. Lord Jesus, Father, uh, thank you for this morning. Lord, whatever we read, uh, Father, whatever we hear, uh, Father, help us to practice it in our lives. I pray for ma'am, pray for pastor also, Lord Jesus, Father, whatever she teaches. Lord Jesus, Father, help us to understand it. Uh, Father, Holy Spirit, you are the best teacher. You are the best counselor. Please teach us, lead us, and guide us, uh, Father. God, please teach us all uh, something new, uh, Father. Rest of the day, we commit in your hands. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so we began looking at Chapter 3 in uh, this APC publication, uh, Code of Honor. We were talking about people. Uh, this book is basically more uh, practical, uh, talks about various practical aspects about uh, about a minister of God, how a minister of uh, God should conduct his life and ministry. So uh, we looked at um, the, the personal life of uh, a minister of God and how he needs to handle his family in chapter 2. And chapter 3 is about people. We know that Christian ministry is all about people. It's ministering to people. It's building lives of people because people um, are... Uh, uh, you know, the ones who make up the church, constitute the church and the kingdom of God. So we began looking at various aspects of how as um, Christian ministers or uh, as those in ministry, uh, not just in ministry, even if you're leading a Bible study group or you're an elder in the church or you're a leader in the church, you know, um, what are the various aspects we need to keep in mind even as we uh, deal with people, even as we minister to uh, people, okay? So we are looking at this uh, point where it says, what is shared in confidence must stay in confidence. So, you know, as uh, people in the ministry or if you're leading a prayer group, a Bible study group, or a, you're a leader uh, of some uh, uh, area in the church, you know, uh, people in your team or people in the church will share uh, their problems, where their difficulties, and we need to learn to keep that in confidence um, uh, because people are trusting us and they're sharing their lives with us. So we need to keep it in confidence. Um, don't use that as a, a subject for gossip or for, you know, uh, just uh, uh, talking about uh, them with other people. Sometimes we can do it very spiritually under the spiritual cover saying that, hey, you know, uh, so-and-so is going through this and this problem. So let's, uh, you know, uh, uh, so please pray for them. I'm sharing this with you because, uh, you know, I want you to pray for them, but don't go and tell it to anybody else. Okay. So I think that's not even the right way to go about it. If somebody's trusting you with their uh, 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 and sharing things in confidence. You know, you can pray about it. That's enough. They can pray about it. We don't have to go and make it as a prayer point and share it with others. When we do that, it actually becomes a uh, gossip. And we also need to be very careful, you know, uh, when we use uh, these life examples as sermon illustrations, because sometimes we can be so tempted to use uh, these um, uh, various scenarios that people go through in life as examples for our sermon illustration and we need to be very, very careful. Uh, we should be also mindful because they might be there in the congregation. And sometimes, even if they're not there and we use people's, um, uh, you know, uh, examples, life examples in the situation that they've gone through and they've come and shared with you, people who listen to you will say, hey, if I go and share my uh, problems with so and so, or this person who's preaching, they might also use my uh, problem as an example. So, might as well not use it. So, it's good to just be very general about the illustrations that you use. Uh, don't be too in depth, even if you're using some of these um, uh, scenarios, case scenarios that people come and share with you about their uh, lives. The next thing is we need to correct people lovingly. Um, 
you know, uh, that's uh, correcting people is something very difficult that we find not only in the area of ministry, but also in the family, in our personal uh, relationships that we have. But, uh, you know, when we uh, uh, correct people, we need to keep um, uh, some things in mind. We can follow a two-step approach. Uh, first thing is warning. And then second approach is correcting. So the first step is uh, warning, you know, just when things are not going right, when things need to change, uh, things are not going the certain way that you want it to go and is expected of that person, then as a leader, you need to step in and take that corrective um, action. Uh, let the person know what they're doing is wrong, how they can correct themselves, you know, uh, and give them, uh, you know, sufficient, uh, communicate with them what needs to be done, how they need to do it. And also, you know, uh, give them sufficient time and space uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to attempt to make the corrections that they, they are required to do. And, um, you know, follow up with them, keep up with them and if they are not uh, you know doing or following the steps that you are uh, bringing in the corrective measures in terms of warning them then it's important that you know you go ahead with the second approach which is um, a correction so you know when things you've given them sufficient time space you've uh, made known to them what they need to do and they they have not changed then you have to bring correction and even when you bring correction you need to bring it uh, in a very loving way and of course we need godly wisdom which means we need to Pray about it. Now, when we bring about correction, uh, correction will depend on two aspects. One is cause, the other is effect. Now, the cause is what is the reason why, in spite of warning the person and helping the person, why is the person not being able to meet the requirements? Uh, so if it has to do with uh, the cause can be, you know, lack of skill or lack of training, uh, lack of proper time management, then we can help that individual, you know, um, develop those skills. But if the problem is, you know, the person is uh, lazy, stubborn, rebellious, doesn't want to work hard, uh, you know, have uh, bad heart attitudes, their motives are not right, uh, they have selfish agendas, they are, um, you know, acting very super spiritual, That which means they know everything, they can do everything, uh, you needn't have to tell them, they will just only do as the spirit leads them, or high-mindedness, then the correction can be quite um, severe um, so it's important to look at what is the cause and then you know based on the cause you know you can bring in the effective uh, measures okay so uh, what is the impact or effect uh, of the individual's failure or wrongdoing if the impact of the individual's failure or wrongdoing is on a small scale and can be controlled it's not affecting the larger body of christ the local church or the the rest of the team members or it's not bringing in strife and division and problems then it's on a small scale things can be controlled so the person can be given more time and space uh, and more correction and uh, more training on how to be more effective in their specific roles and responsibilities but if uh, you know the uh, the the uh, effect is, you know, on, on a larger scale going to impact great, uh, on a, a wider scale, impacting uh, the, the church and, you know, more people, then, you know, and they're setting a bad example and it's affecting many people, then the correction uh, is, uh, uh, you know, going to be more strict or more severe where the person can be released from that area of ministry uh, or, you know, uh, taken, the responsibility can be taken away. Uh, and But we need to remember that when we are correcting people and we are bringing in this correction, it is always to bless them, okay? Uh, it is for the well-being of the person. Um, and, uh, you know, we are trying to safeguard also uh, the other people who are involved in the church or in the team. Uh, so try not to... 
uh, when you're bringing in correction, try not to destroy your relationship with that person, you know, uh, and also it's important to protect your heart, which means it's important that when you are correcting the person to know that you are doing what is right before uh, God. And if you have any ill feeling uh, against that person, you know, uh, it's important that you ask God to deal with uh, you and also, you know, maintain a good relationship with that person, uh, bring in unity and try to, you know, uh, uh, be uh, united with that person, try to uh, keep that bond of relationship strong and also remain uh, open as ministers of God or team leaders or people in leadership position, uh, you know, to relate to, to give, to receive from that individual as well. Not that because they have uh, not been able to fulfill a specific responsibility doesn't mean they're worthless and useless. Uh, we can receive from them, we can relate to them, and also when you relate to them, we can also mentor them and uh, nurture them, okay? Um, now, when uh, you're addressing, uh, uh, you know, this is what we're talking about here in this context of correcting people, it's not about uh, when you're having personal conflicts uh, with somebody. This is uh, what I just mentioned is when we're talking about, uh, you know, when we are in leadership position or managing teams, you know, how when people fail in their roles and responsibilities, what we need to do, because that is going to affect the larger uh, congregation of the local church or the rest of the team members. And this is not about uh, addressing personal issues or personal conflicts okay now when we are correcting people we need to correct them in private but when we up, uh, when we praise people you know we need to uh, praise them applaud them in public give them the credit for what they have done applaud them in uh, public but when we correct people we need to be uh, careful that we don't talk about what they have done wrong to others uh, in terms of gossip or even as a prayer point you know, just saying that because when you're saying that it's a prayer point is also one way is gossip. So we, you know, when people do something wrong, they don't, are not able to fulfill their roles and responsibilities, they fall away. We need to be very sensitive. Um, but when it comes to things where uh, somebody is in, uh, you know, a leadership position and they have done something wrong and uh, the rest of the team needs to know why you've taken that corrective action, why the person had to step aside from his role, why the person had to leave the team, why the person was removed from his ministry office or his role in the church, then this needs to be communicated in public uh, to the church members or to the team. Uh, but when we do that, we need to also be mindful uh, that we are not destroying the character, the integrity, uh, or uh, bringing harm to uh, the individual, but, you know, just addressing the issue, what uh, was not done, uh, and how it's going to you know, affect the larger team or uh, the church as a whole. And hence, we've asked that person to uh, step aside. So we need to be very careful and we need godly wisdom and we need to pray about uh, 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 things when we bring about correction to people, even as we are in the ministry or in the leadership position. Okay. Now, um, uh, we need to... Uh, uh, be mindful even as we deal with people that we have a personal strategy for handling difficult uh, situations. So, you know, we learn when we correct people, when we journey with people, when we work with people, there are so many things that we learn. And so it's important that, you know, you put, uh, when, as you learn, you bring about or you have your own strategy in how to handle uh, difficult uh, situations. So Pastor has written, uh, because he's written this book, he's talking about how he has brought about personal strategies to handle difficult uh, situations. So he basically says that, you know, um, uh, when he wants to communicate things to the team, uh, to the leadership team, the, the rest of the pastors or the church or the staff, he sends an email. Okay, so that way things are clearer, uh, what needs to be done, uh, 
But when things need to be discussed, he brings it out in the staff meeting or in the pass through team meeting. Uh, and then he gets a collective input. And then, uh, you know, uh, the team decides what best needs to be uh, done. But, you know, uh, when it comes to difficult situations, when handling things with people, uh, he says it's best not to uh, send an email or a WhatsApp message or, a, uh, you know, speak over the phone. Because when we do that, people are uh, reading or perceiving things from their own uh, uh, emotions, their own mindsets. They are putting their uh, thoughts, their emotions uh, into uh, what they are reading or what they are hearing. So that can be very, very uh, dangerous and it can, uh, you know, worsen the matters even more. Uh, so, you know, it's good when you are correcting people that you sit face to face and you speak to them. So they're able to see your body language, your tone of voice, they're able to understand, you can share your emotions, what you are feeling, what you're going through as a leader, why you're doing what you're doing. And then it becomes uh, much more easier to talk things out with the person. But even as you're bringing in correction, um, or handling difficult situations is important to listen. So Pastor says, you know, he does a lot of listen. He listens and listens and listens to the person. And also he's listening to what God is trying to tell him uh, through what the person is saying. And then he, once his listening is done, he's listened from God, you know, he makes a decision and then he communicates it to the person. Okay. So that is some of the strategies that we can follow use uh, when we deal with people especially when we are correcting them but it's good to uh, we learn from our own experience so good to uh, put you know have your own personal uh, strategy okay what we are saying in this book is basically what is uh, you know has been the experience of pastor so he's writing his experience which is sharing it um, but you know um, you can also come up with your own uh, strategies as the spirit of the lord uh, leads you the next one is don't be a boss over um, god's people look at what um, first peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 4 says can somebody read that please first peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 4 the elders who are among you i exhort i who am i a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God who is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that, you know, even as we are given leadership position or oh God uh, entrusts sheep to us and we are shepherds, you know, whether we have a Bible study group or prayer group or, you know, prayer cell meeting in our house or you're a pastor or uh, you lead a team in church, it's important that we don't, uh, you know, um, um, you know, first of all, that we are serving willingly and not out of com compulsion. We're doing things not for dishonest gain, uh, but, you know, just wanting to, having a serving heart, wanting to serve God. Um, and we are not lording over people, uh, to, uh, lording over those God has entrusted to us. But what we need to do here, it says, is we need to be examples of the flock so we need to lead by uh, example uh, and we need to be like the chief shepherd you know who led by example and not being lords or bossing over uh, people sometimes you know uh, in the name of honor uh, uh, a spiritual leader can misuse and of often abuse people who serve them, you know, get them to carry their Bibles or their bags or their, you know, follow them like, a, you know, like a, a security guard, um, you know, uh, respect them because they're highly anointed and all of those things. That is abusing people and that is not what God wants us to do. But we need to, you know, lead uh, by example and not lord over people okay in the same um uh 
uh, way we we should not control people and we should not manipulate them uh, sometimes you know as uh, as leaders as pastors we think we are like spiritual fathers spiritual mentors spiritual mothers you know for the, uh, 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 to those god has entrusted to us and in uh, uh, even as we try to protect them uh, you know we come to a place where we begin not protecting them but we try to control them okay so uh, we need to be uh, mindful of this fact that we are here to serve people uh, in terms of nurturing them in their faith and not dominating their life of faith we are here to help them nurture them and help them grow in their faith walk with god and not dominate um, their life of faith and not control them so we see that in uh, you know some of the leaders you know uh, they have a control over every area of the people's life that they are ministering to you know they control their jobs their uh, if they uh, their, who they marry where they go what they're doing you know um, uh, even if uh, you know if they visit other churches or they go for other prayer meetings or you know uh, go to listen to some other pastors or men and women of god or some crusades or they give um, you know their tithes or they want to contribute to some other mission organizations you know the leader or the pastor is not happy and um, you know uh, they begin to control and manipulate uh, uh, people you know and they issue threats and uh, you know they direct people what they should do what they shouldn't be doing and I've heard some people tell me that you know if we don't go to church that Sunday uh, Monday morning the pastor will be in their house asking them why they did not attend uh, church so that is like really controlling and uh, you know it is not um, uh, not protecting people but we're controlling people and when we're telling people you know where they should uh, 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 you know uh, uh, give their tithes what they should do how they should live is uh, you know it's all actually spiritual witchcraft so it's important that as leaders as pastors as ministers you know the, the people God has entrusted to us that we teach them we counsel them uh, uh, we teach them uh, 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 from the word of God we give them the meat from the word of God the revelations the truth from the word of God but we let them control Control their own lives. We let them make their own decisions and take their own uh, and take responsibility for their own life. We don't tell them who they marry, which job they need to, you know, where they need to go and work, um, uh, where they have to live, whether you know, even their children, which school they have to go, and all of those things. You know, we've had people who've shared this that how people have controlled uh, their lives, and it's very very sad. So we need to give people complete freedom, whether they want to go and attend other churches or attend other Bible study groups or prayer groups or attend uh, crusades that come in the city or give financially and support other minister, uh, ministries. It is their responsibility and it's not as us as leaders and pastors to control their um, uh, lives. Uh, and we need to know that, you know, uh, if people belong to us belong to our church or belong to our prayer group or our cell group or a bible study group if they have a sense of belonging they will come back because you know this is where they feel home this is where they feel loved this is where they feel accepted this is where they feel uh, their heart belongs so you know they will just come back you don't have to control them or manipulate uh, them okay uh, and the other thing we need to keep in mind is as we relate to people is that we need to overcome our own personal uh, insecurities look at what um second corinthians 3 um uh, chapter one chapter three verses one five and uh, six says can somebody read that please second corinthians chapter three one five and six do we begin again to command ourselves or do we need as some others epistles of com commendation commendation to you, commendation to you or letters of commendation from you not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves but our sufficiency is from god who also made us sufficient as minister of the new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter skills 
but the spirit gives life amen so here paul is saying that you know um uh, he's saying that you know we don't need any uh, recommendation uh, from man because he says that he knows that his completeness in ministry comes from God he's called by God and God is the one who makes him complete so we remember we learned that you know when we uh, are called to a specific function God gives us the grace you know he enables us with the gifts and the grace that we need to fulfill that function so he's writing here and saying you know uh, it's not that we feel that we are sufficient in ourselves paul is saying hey i might be uh, you know i i might know the old testament well i have i might have studied under the best of the best teachers including gamaliel you know he was a, a well taught well trained uh, scholar uh, in the in the old testament law uh, the apostle paul uh, and he he says you know it's not that i feel i'm sufficient by myself uh, but he says my sufficiency comes from uh, god and he says we have been made sufficient as ministers of the new uh, covenant okay so you know um, that should kind of bring us to a place where it you know, we can get rid of all our insecurities. So sometimes as ministers of God, we carry a lot of personal insecurities, you know, and because of that, we, uh, you know, we operate or do ministry out of these uh, insecurities. And our insecurities can be seen in various ways. So for example, you know, if you're somebody who is, in, who is very insecure, and you you see other ministers getting all the attention and people you know following them then you try to make yourself as someone great as someone big so in your sermons or in your uh, you know bible study groups and your prayer groups uh, you try to you know uh, say how anointed you are how powerful you are and you can give examples of how god is mightily using you and you know, how you're flowing in the gifts how many miracles you did you know so that people would see you as someone really great and they will not follow other ministers of god or sometimes you know we can um when we are insecure uh, and we feel that someone else is preaching uh, better than us you know we stop people from hearing them so we say hey don't listen to that man of god don't listen to you know uh, this famous preacher you know his lifestyle is not like good he has done this he's done that uh, his uh, his teachings are all wrong it's not in accordance with god's word uh, why do we do that because we are insecure and we we, we want to stop people from listening to their sermons and we want them to listen to our our sermons so sometimes you know when people um, may leave our church or our bible study group or our prayer group and go to another church then you know we tell them uh, you know they that they should not be visiting that church or that bible study group or prayer group and uh, you know uh, uh, we uh, uh, instead of preaching from the pulpit from the word of god we use the pulpit time to put down men and women of god put down other ministries uh, tell them how uh, they're living their lifestyle is wrong and that is a abuse of the pulpit time god given time of preaching and teaching from god's word and we are accountable to god firstly because we're talking talking about another anointed man of god a man who's a man or woman who's called by god we have no right to talk about them you know and we also have no right to use the pulpit time god given time to teach from his word teach people from his word you know use that to put down other ministries or to control manipulate and tell people what they should be doing and what they should not be doing but all this stems from our own insecurity because we don't feel secure that people love us people want to come to our church and you know uh, people think that we are uh, you know not as good compared to other men and women of uh, god and sometimes also you know if you're not given the front seat if you're not given a place of honor um, if you're not applauded if you're not welcomed if we are uh, you know uh, if you uh, if uh, our names are not addressed in the right way for example if we if we are uh, you know doctor so and so you know and we miss telling reverend doctor you know uh, selina makwana you know then i can get upset you know how the how come the person just said reverend selina makwana why didn't they use reverend doctor selina makwana so we get you know very very up 
upset, we get irritated, offended, and uh, you know we're not given the seat of in the uh, in the front or on the stage. We're not called up. We're not recognized. All that uh, anger um, that stems up is because of deep seated insecurity, and also you know uh, sometimes. Um, uh, in our ministry, there can be other people in our team who can pray better than us, preach better than us, teach better than us, and uh, we, uh, you know, we get a little uh, uh, insecure because they might take our position. People might love them. People might see them as better leaders or better people than us, and so we don't give them, uh, you know, time to preach or teach or pray, and we tr uh, we try to put them. Uh, down and we uh, we uh, we don't want them to progress and that is also stemming from deep insecurity. Uh, also, sometimes when we are insecure, you know, we talk about uh, the number of places we've gone and preached, number of people who invited us, uh, and uh, you know, the miracles that we have done, uh, how God is using us powerfully. Or sometimes we can also talk about how we are associated with other great ministers, other great ministries, just to portray that hey, you know, I'm also a great uh, man of God. I'm also connected with people in high places, uh, uh, rich and the uh, famous, okay? So all this is stemming up from our insecurities and we need to guard this. We need to watch over this because this can also bring about a downfall in our own ministry. This can also bring about division in the team. So we need to be very, very careful, you know, and we need to ask God to give us the grace to get rid of all of these insecurities in our own life and know that our competence comes, our completeness comes uh, from God, even as he has made us able ministers of the new covenant. We are not able in ourselves, but God has made us able, okay? The next thing is don't provide a platform for people with the personal agendas. Now, sometimes people can join your team, your church, and they want leadership positions or responsibilities. Uh, and we need to be very careful who we uh, put in and what we, responsibilities we give them. We need to watch over people, uh, whether their motives are pure, their heart is pure before God, you know, uh, uh, give them small responsibilities and see whether, you know, their heart is right, their motives are uh, pure, uh, whether, you know, they are willing to interact with others, they're keeping the bond of unity, they're willing to serve other, other people, uh, they're willing to work as a team in unity and oneness, and they're comfortable, even if they work hard, they're not recognized, they're not applo uh, uh, applauded, uh, it's okay, they are willing to serve. Also see if they are, you know, they are aligned themselves to the vision and the direction of the leadership. They're not just doing whatever they want. They're not doing what they think is right, what they feel is uh, right. They're not doing their own things. Uh, so it's important before we give people or put people into leadership roles and responsibilities that, um, you know, we give them small uh, roles without giving them any titles and watch them and if they fit in and they're doing things um, right you know it's important then we can give them uh, responsibilities and roles and then maybe follow that with uh, uh, titles okay look at what Paul tells Timothy in first Timothy chapter 3 verse 10 he tells uh, Paul has left Timothy young Timothy in Titus uh, uh, sorry in Ephesus and he's telling uh, Timothy to appoint leaders and even as he's telling him to appoint leaders he's telling you know in first Timothy chapter 3 verse 10 he says but let these also first be tested then let them serve as deacons being found blameless so you know he said first test people and who do we need to test he's not talking about leaders he's talking about deacons deacons are just those who serve maybe those who set up the uh, uh, you know, set up team, pack up team, those who are laying the chairs, who those who are serving coffee, those who are welcoming people. He's saying even such kind of people, test them first. And if they are found blameless, then you give them, you know, responsibilities and then uh, titles as well. So when it's just for deacons which who do uh, administrative roles, how much more careful we need to be careful, uh, you know, vigilant when we uh, when we think about uh, assigning roles and responsibilities for those in leadership uh, teams. You know, sometimes people will come to us and they want to be part of our team, our church, 
you know, uh, we need to be very careful because some of them will be promoting their own, uh, you know, they will just want to come and serve, but later on they would want to promote their own personal ministries or their own business. So it's first important to test people. It's biblical. That's what Paul tells uh, Timothy. Ensure their hearts are right uh, uh, with God and right in serving uh, before you give them uh, leadership roles and responsibilities okay the next one is uh, to not fight what you do not understand uh, you know um, uh, we can't just put God in a box you know uh, so we just can't uh, when we see a move of God we can't say hey this is not what is in the Bible, this is not biblical, so this is not a move of God. Uh, yes, God will never do anything that will violate his word, that will go against what he's spoken in his word or what is a part of his nature, but he's also not confined to his word. So, for example, uh, we see in Acts that, you know, um, that even Peter's shadow healed people. So they brought uh, sick people and laid them uh, in the path where Peter walked so that even Peter's uh, shadow would uh, uh, heal them. But we don't see this happening anywhere else in the Old Testament. So when it happened, we can't say, hey, I don't think this is right. This is not the move of God. This is something demonic. This has not happened. Uh, but we see that, you know, even as Peter's shadow fell on those who sick, the sick were healed. So, you know, we need to look at the fruit, the outcome of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is uh, happening. So, you know, God can do new things in new ways, which can surprise us all. Um, and uh, sometimes we also, you know, expect God to use certain kind of people in certain ways, but he can use, you know, different people in different ways to manifest uh, his um, uh, His gifts, his, um, his, uh, uh, his healing, his deliverance, uh, his work, uh, his kingdom uh, uh, purposes and plans through people. So we shouldn't fight it and we should not say that it is wrong. Uh, it's wrong to react in such way uh, of course you know uh, how do we know when it is the right move of god uh, even if it's an unusual move of god it's not anywhere else we see in the bible how do we know that it is uh, 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 right even though it doesn't fit our logic our reasoning it doesn't fit the way we think and we want to do things or god has been doing things uh, we need to look at the fruit Okay, if people are acting out of carnal nature and fleshly nature, you know, then we know that uh, it's it's not of uh, God. And also, you need to see the fruit. The fruit is that people's lives are being transformed. People are coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We can see their lives being transformed. People are healed, restored uh, from demonic affliction. Uh, you know, uh, uh, strongholds are broken. Uh, you know, we know that it is the work of God. So it's important that we see the fruit, and then we are able. To judge. So if it's of the carnal nature, it's of the fleshly nature, then we see that there is basically no fruit. People's lives are not transformed, changed, there's no healing and deliverance that has happening, but people are more bound to things. Okay. So uh, we need to st stand back, watch, you know, and look at the fruit, and the fruit will tell us, you know, whether this unusual working of God. Uh, is uh, from God or is from Satan or just the fleshly carnal uh, nature. But, you know, don't fight it. Don't think, uh, react in a wrong way. Don't say it's wrong. Uh, look at the fruit and then decide. Okay. Some things that people say are uh, not worth your time. Look at what Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 21 and 22 says. Can somebody read that please? Justice 7, 21 and 22. Also, do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also, your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. Amen. Thank you. So here, you know, um, you know, 
there are people who are part of our team you know who we have uh, uh, mentored we have vested in we have invested in their lives we have taught them trained them and uh, you know they have uh, have a good relationship with us they support us they encourage us but suddenly all of a sudden you know um they criticize us and they point out uh, uh, you know our faults and our shortcomings and uh, we see that you know they are kind of retaliating they kind of bringing in division they're criticizing you and you're wondering hey what happened this person was so supportive so encouraging what happened suddenly i was begin to retaliate uh, uh, everything what I'm saying is retaliating, is criticizing. Uh, people forget the good that we uh, do for them. But, you know, we should not take that to heart, just as we read in Ecclesiastes. You know, we need to be strong on the inside. We need to focus on what God has called us to do. Uh, even when such things happen, we need to continue uh, strong. Don't, uh, you know, take time to fight against people because it's going to drain you of your time, your energy. Uh, you know, you can't fight them. It's going to affect you. Uh, don't retaliate. Don't quarrel. You know, all we can do is, you know, just learn to pray, uh, release our feelings, our hurt, our pain uh, to God, and keep moving forward uh, in doing what God has called us to uh, do. You know, I've been working with um, handling teams uh, the last, uh, uh, the last, say, 20, 15 plus years of my life and yes people are difficult to work with you know so um, I've had people who've joined the team and they're very supportive very helpful uh, you know uh, but suddenly they you know they change they begin to retaliate they're trying to bring in division uh, they try to uh, you know talk behind your back and try to make life difficult and I'm sensing that I'm seeing that I'm knowing that uh, but I, you know, what, what I have done is I have not fought them, you know, because I said, God, I don't have the time, first of all, because I, I do so many, I handle so many ministry areas. I don't have the time. I don't have that kind of energy. And I'm not somebody who's, who can really fight people. I can't, uh, you know, uh, you know. I'm not good at um, winning arguments or getting through uh, in pointing out to people what they have done, what they have said. Uh, you know, so I said, God, you have to fight my battles. And I have seen God fight my battles. I've just stepped aside. I've seen God fight my battles. God either pulls them out and the, the main leader notices it's brought to their notice without even me saying it. And this, you know, they either leave the team, they sent out and, um, so it's important that we don't waste our time and energy because you know we are here to do what god has called us to do there's so much more useful things that we can do and i'm saying god i don't have the time to fight them because it's going to bring about division in the team it's going to waste my time and energy and my peace of mind uh it's going to you know divert my focus and i'm going to get distracted i'm just going to do what you have called me to do god and you just take care of them and i've seen god fight my battles and because he has promised he will fight our battles and he does it and i've just seen that so beautifully and wonderfully he just fights it and i just have to sit back and actually um, just watch okay so uh, when people give you feedback uh, yes you we need to take feedback it's not that we are perfect that uh, you know uh, that all is well with us uh, because we are in leadership positions so you know if they bring uh, constructive useful feedback you know take it if it is not constructive useful feed feedback is just criticism just let it go don't hold that against people because they might uh, see things in their own lenses their colored glasses that they are wearing they might have misjudged you misunderstood your motives and your the way of doing things uh, but you know don't get easily moved by what people say and do if you if you get easily moved by what people say and do, you cannot last long in the ministry. You can't serve God. You can't, you know, um, um, uh, fulfill your uh, uh, calling. And also as a leader in any field, you will not be able to move ahead. So, you know, be very, very mindful of that. Uh, look at what Paul says to the, uh, you know, uh, what we need to do is we need to leave our offenses behind. It's not worth carrying uh, them with you. Okay, look at what Paul says to the church and believers in Galatia. You know, he's labored with them in the faith 
and they are uh, even as he's labored uh, and bringing them to the faith you know they are easily swayed by some other people uh, who insist that some of the old testament practices of the law still have to be observed okay they still have to keep those old testament rituals and laws and uh, it seems that you know paul feels that his what he has labored uh, with the church at galatia has gone in vain but however he what does he say he says hey you people have not injured me at all that's what he says in galatians chapter 4 verse uh, 12 he says you know um, uh, I'm afraid for you, lest I've labored for you in vain. But look at what he says, you have not injured me at all. So Paul is not offended with what uh, the Galatians have done, even though it's caused him uh, hurt and pain. But he says, you know, you've not injured me at uh, all. Uh, so we need to leave aside offenses not worth carrying because that is going to eat you up like acid and destroy your peace of mind your ministry and uh you know it's going to be a hindrance from you stepping forward and fulfilling what god has called you to uh do uh sometimes we need to also correct ourselves uh another example from paul's life when paul went for his first missionary journey he went along with barnabas um, and barnabas brought his uh, cousin john mark and you know uh, somewhere during that first missionary journey john mark uh, decides that he doesn't want to continue with uh, barnabas and paul and he doesn't go along with them and uh, paul is very very angry so when they want to go on their second missionary journey, Barnabas says, hey, let's take John Mark as well. And Paul disagrees. And they have such, such a sharp disagreement that you know Paul and Barnabas part ways, and they go their separate ways uh, 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 um, with different uh, people. Okay, But we see that you know uh, John Mark uh, grows in his faith. He becomes mature. And Paul begins to see that. And when Paul begins to see that, he corrects himself. And he realizes that he has made a mis uh, mistake in how he has judged John Mark. And we see that he welcomes John Mark back into his ministry as a fellow minister. And he promotes him in the ministry. So here we learn uh, a valuable lesson that we don't carry any form of grudge or offenses. And we leave the past behind and we move ahead. And, uh, you know, um, as ministers of God, we must learn not to let people's actions uh, offend us. And, uh, you know, even if it offends us, we must learn to leave it behind and walk into the things that God has for us. Okay. The next one is even as people grow, people change. So be ready to let them go. So people will come into your team, your church, you know, uh, part of your ministry uh, for a certain period of time. They'll journey along with you for uh, a few months, some of them few years, some of them will stay longer and you have sown into their lives. You have fed them, you have uh, mentored them, you have uh, you know got them to uh, uh, you know move ahead in life but you know they want to move uh, ahead they want to go and start their own ministry go to another new place or start another church or you know they want to move out of your team uh, at that time we should not be angry with them we should not uh, say hey you know I've invested so many years into your life I've taught you you came so immature as a child blah blah you know how can you leave me how can you you know go away that is being very immature on our parts what we need to do is just as we readily and lovingly accepted them and welcomed them you know we must also be ready and willing to bless them and let them go into what god has in store for them because maybe god is leading them elsewhere and they had come in for a time and a season into your life into your ministry and you have blessed them and you need to be um uh, uh, excited that hey somebody who I have mentored you know have brought them into faith and matured them is going out stepping out you should be proud not controlling them and not uh, manipulating them you know even as I uh, uh, work with teams there are people who step in and they step out and they want to leave and I'm just as welcoming and as loving as when they join in and even as when they leave I just bless them and send them away because hey this is not my uh, kingdom this is not uh, uh, my business I'm in the business of uh, uh, serving the Lord it is his kingdom his business his ministry and he knows uh, if a person is stepping out he will bring 
the right person in. So I don't have to get agitated or irritated or, uh, you know, feel insecure. I just let go. So let go of people. I just bless them uh, with joy, with happiness. And, you know, uh, wherever God leads them, pray for them. And if they want to come back and join the team later on, you know, welcome them uh, back. Don't hold things against them. Okay, we'll stop here. Uh, we'll continue after the break. Um, thank you all for your patience and I'll see you after the break.